I speak with the voice of MacDonald of the Isles, of Lochmadi, Balranald, St. Kilda. I speak with the voice of the McKinleys of Skye. I speak with the voice of the Langs of Logie Easter, of Tain and of Nig and of Calrossi Farm. I speak transplanted of Bredalbin, Prince Edward Island, Calgary, Alberta, Toronto, Ontario. I speak translated of Horokiwi and Wellington. I speak as an immigrant researcher, a seeker of circles. No woman is an island, even from away. Abianakdu, Abianakdu, Abianakdu. Kia ora, bonjour, welcome. Great to see you all here and to see my virtual colleagues wherever you may be tuning in from. My sincere thanks to the organizers and the hosts, to my partner in crime, Matt Plummer, who dobbed me in for this particular role, and to Nick Jones, who this morning reminded me the last time I was up on such a podium was 2012, which appears like ancient history to me, if not last century, but definitely BC, before COVID. So uh, yes. Uh, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. How many of you are guilty of producing a bar or a line graph, a pie chart, or what about scatter plots, lattice charts, heat maps, mosaic charts, histograms, chloropleth maps? According to Jonathan Schwabisch in his just released book, Better Data Visualizations, a guide for scholars, researchers, and wonks, there are at least 80 visualization types that should be part of your toolkit. Each tells a story, but only if you and your audience are conversant in the visual grammar of such representations. Today I'm going to talk about several different kinds of storytelling that push the idea of story into sometimes uncomfortable territory. Stories that involve your audience as makers and co-designers, and stories that expose the dark underbelly of gender, race, and creed. Along the way, I'll share some suggestions about what makes a good story and profile some of my own collaborative adventures, as well as inspiring story work from around the world. But let's first set the scene. You all know what data is, right? Minister Verrill emphasized the importance of data. Wrong. Johanna Drucker argues there is no such thing as data. That is observable and recorded fact, objective reality, factoids if you really must. Information is what she terms capta from the Latin, meaning taken or captured. She claims capta is taken actively while data is assumed to be a given, able to be recorded and observed. From this distinction, capta and data, a world of differences arises. Humanistic inquiry acknowledges the situated, the partial, and constitutive character of knowledge production. The recognition that knowledge itself is constructed, is taken, and is not simply given as a natural representation of pre-existing fact. In humanities approaches to graphical display, Drucker critiques data visualization. She suggests it's an intellectual Trojan horse that masks assumptions underlying the collection and use of source data, suppresses how data are reconfigured by the tools used to produce visual artifacts, and privileges knowledge claims which obscure the inherently representational nature of knowledge. Former New York Times data artist and inaugural innovator in residence at the Library of Congress, Jer Thorpe, would agree. From 2013 to 2017, his Office for Creative Research explored an idea called data humanism through a diverse set of practices, including data visualization, field work, and art production. Its core tenet was that data is a human artifact, more personal than computational. As he said, quote, this idea of data humanism is in stark contrast to the mechanistic thinking of the big data era, unquote. I like the phrase data humanism. While scientists revel in big data, humanists wallow in what we call rich data, qualitative, unstructured, messy, evocative. Data humanism foregrounds the complexity of rich data, inserts us in the frame, 
and exposes our own role and ethical positionality in reframing the world. Critically, it puts the humane back in human. So taking data humanism as our morning mantra, how can we tell stories with data? In its simplest form, there will be a beginning, a middle, and an end corresponding to context, deli uh, discovery, and conclusion. Here's essayist and novelist Kurt Vonnegut explaining the process. Jim has created a body of work of startling eccentricity and universal appeal. His singular view of the world applies not just to his stories and characters, but to some of his theories as well. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of story can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. <clears throat> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the BE axis. B stands for beginning. <laughs> e stands for electricity. <laughs> now this is an exercise in relativity, really. It's the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins. So we'll start a little above average is why do I get a depressing person? We'll start the whole thing, we call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man, and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But, it's a good way to remember. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. They never get sick of it. All right, not copyrighted. Another story is also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> Got it back again. People like that. Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. It's, computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, Surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. <laughs> anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Not that she think lower, no. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. Is she, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her mascara. <laughs> Gives her means of transportation, goes to the party, dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, 
She poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe pets. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> Storytelling is not such a linear process. One of the key principles of storytelling is impact. How do you combine data with visuals, with narrative to generate a call to action? As Thorpe suggests, we make visualizations, online tools, community platforms, and public interventions that increase data literacy, facilitate understanding, and promote equality. But our work is meant to provoke surprise and delight while driving critical thought and facilitating understanding. Once upon a time, there was a man called William Colenso. Like many Victorians, he was a man of many interests. He was a polymath, he was a printer, he was a missionary, a linguist, educationalist, author, politician, letter writer, botanist, lexicographer, explorer, you name it. Such polymaths, both male and female, lived rich, interconnected lives that populate the corners and pockets of our 19th century imaginings. But how do you tell their stories? They remain challenging figures, enigmatic even, for a traditional biographical enterprise. In 1938, Jean-Paul Sartre asked, is biography even possible? And come the digital age, Elizabeth Podnik's remark that today the two biggest challenges notable in biography arise both for the technologies that allow radical new ways of producing, disseminating, and theorizing the genre, and from an expansion of the definition of what biography actually means. So one way of exploring biographical expression in the digital age might look like this, and it was via a combination of exhibition and digital artwork at the Turnbull Gallery at the National Library of New Zealand here in Wellington. Using the popular Victorian aesthetic and knowledge building platform of the Wunderkammer, or Cabinet of Curiosities, objects were loosely grouped that related to Colenso and had a subtext narrative in and of themselves, but it was the audience that had to sit in the cushy chairs from the Maritime Museum, try to make the connections themselves. There was minimal labeling, minimal signage. How do you connect each of these objects in the various cabinets or on the wall? Viewers could sit, they could view, they could compose their own stories. Uh, they could read actual books from the whirligig. Um, we, people suggested, well, you know, where's the glass of whiskey on the stand? And they said, pipes, tobacco smoke should be, should be filtered in. Uh, but it was a case of trying to get people to be active consumers of knowledge rather than passive recipients of someone else's idea of what biography might be. We could have produced, as a part of it, a classic network analysis, thanks Dion, colleague of ours. Um, we could have produced a knowledge graph, but we wanted to understand the commingling of the development, circulation, and impact of ideas and practices, whether they were scientific, whether they were intellectual, religious, political, social domains, all in one. So what we produced then was this digital artwork, which is the legacy artifact. It's called Unexpected Connections, Reimagining the 19th Century Through Generative Art. Our installation, interpreted and localized by YT Outer Press's technical lead and software engineer, Rhys Owen, uses a randomized search algorithm to draw down some 350 assets from digital New Zealand. Some of them are maps, some are newspapers, manuscripts, artworks, etc. Other printed material that relates to this figure, William Colenso. Through creative coding and algorithmic processing, the interface reassembles them into a suite of five transparent overlays, randomly resized and cropped, repeated to evoke the geology, if not the paleontology, of the archival research enterprise. In the full web delivered version, each object can be investigated further through metadata hyperlinks to the original collecting institutions. In future, images will be able to be saved, curated, and shared. So the digital artwork complements the physical exhibition by suggesting, if not exposing, how serendipitous links between objects can be assembled to create beautiful artworks and evocative palimpsests. Chance encounters generate unexpected connections. 
One of our inspirations was the Australian academic creative coder and printmaker Mitchell Whitelaw's interactive work Succession, Digital Fossils for an Industrial Age. He was referencing Newcastle's on Tyne's industrial heritage, and it's a heritage founded on coal. He speculated that the future state of industrial capitalism could be expressed through a series of what he called visual fossils that reveal layers of our shared heritage, rearranging and compressing them to seek out new meanings and latent stories. But Unexpected also took inspiration from Harry Ricketts' study of the great war poets. Strange Meetings powerfully recounts documented meetings between writers such as Rupert Brooke, Siegfried Sassoon, Vera Britton, but partway through, Ricketts invents an imaginary conversation between Wilfred Owen and Edward Thomas, which deploys extant sources, but voices the writers in innovative novelistic ways. This fusion of literary criticism, biography, and creative nonfiction liberates the author and the reader, offering a world of possibilities when thinking about those strange conjunctions that occur in the archive when documents sitting alongside each other suddenly bring new understandings to bear, suddenly generate new and unexpected stories. These moments in the research archive is what the French pre-revolutionary uh, academic Arlette Farge calls the frisson of research, the goût de l'archive, the allure, but actually the taste, the goût, the goût of the archive, the taste of the archive. She suggests the reality of the archive lies not only the clues it contains, but what is left out. And as historians, how do you voice those moments of absence? You're like a prowler searching for what is buried away in the archives, looking for the trail of a person or an event, remaining attentive to that which has fled. I like to think of that allure as ghost-like, traces and suggestions, hints and odors that populate the archival encounter. And the storytelling that results from those encounters is a form of layering, a palimpsest, an assemblage of objects that evoke much more than simply physical material or digital forms. As data scientists, we should interrogate what's missing from the data and be upfront about the implications for our research. If we tell stories with data, we also need to tell stories with metadata and paradata. Descriptions of data found in metadata are, like data, hardly neutral. They bespeak traditions of collecting practices, uh, folksonomies that have shaken down into taxonomies, institutions that are powerful gatekeepers of knowledge. Paradata are descriptions of how data and metadata are sourced and used in a specific project. You'd probably call it documentation. And you know, it's usually a chore. It's an after effect. Oftentimes, you just sort of relegate it to the side or to your research assistant and hope they can do it. And often, it doesn't get done. And yet, paradata can tell compelling meta-narratives that situate researchers in a reflective space of self-scrutiny and rendered otherwise hidden assumptions transparent and accountable. As the new open access collection, Data Visualization in Society, explains, quote, the expansion of data visualization in society requires a new kind of literacy if it is to enable citizens to act in informed and critical ways. It also requires the assessment of data visualization's role in democracy and the reassessment of democratic theory in light of developments in data visualization. This means asking a huge range of questions about the relationship between data visualization and democracy, considering factors in visualization consumption and production, processes that affect engagement, factors which might extend beyond technical and textual matters, such as class, gender, race, age, location, political outlook, and education of the audience members. All this happened, more or less, in her widely popular TED talk, The Power of Vulnerability, Bryn Brown coined the phrase, stories are data with soul. The phrase not only emphasizes that narrative is the key to understanding and communicating data, but that is deeply implicated, the human dimension of storytelling should not be forgotten. This techno, social, cultural interface is echoed in Hayden White's assertion that not only is all history narrative, but those narratives are fiction. 
His most revolutionary claim is that narratives are not a representation of or depiction of historical reality, but are themselves a way of creating and perpetuating political and social order in the first place. So this might go against the grain of many of you who assume history, even in the post-truth era, provides some sort of intellectual or moral compass to guide, if not recalibrate, our understanding of world events. However, history is not chronology. It's a construction of reality. It's a manufactured conceit. Remember that old truism, history is written by the winners. Contemporary South African black feminist scholar, Sarojini Nadar, has developed the story rubric for creating and interrogating narratives. Story sits at the heart of indigenous story work and has galvanized underrepresented and minority communities. When George Floyd was murdered on 25 May 2020, Black Lives Matter protests that started in Minneapolis went viral. One infographic visualized the pro test pandemic this way. A static depiction, hardly inspiring or provoking a call to action. The Washington Post and the Pudding collated social media data and stitched together 143 live streams with timestamps and location details to produce this fly-through animation, which offers both quick scanning and a deeper inline experience. Note that you need to be a paid subscriber to be able to view it. As powerful as the interactive presentation might be, digital exclusion is the main message. A different kind of story work was created by black artist Adrian Brandon, who produced a series of hand-colored portraits for an exhibition he entitled Stolen. It was dedicated to the many black people that were robbed of their lives at the hands of the police. In addition to using markers and pencil, he said, I use time as a medium to define how long each portrait is colored in. One year of life equals one minute of color. Tamar Rice was 12 when he was murdered, so I colored his portrait for 12 minutes. As a person of color, I know that my future can be stolen from me if I'm driving with a broken taillight, playing my music too loud, or reaching for my phone at the wrong time. So for each of these portraits, I played with the harsh relationship between time and death. I want the viewer to see how much empty space is left in these lives, stories that will never be told, space that can never be filled. This emptiness represents holes in their families and our community who will be forever stuck with the question, who were they becoming? Scrolling through the online gallery and clicking on individual portraits translates otherwise faceless statistics into damning social commentary. In a galaxy far, far away, Deconstructing and decolonizing narratives is one thing. Putting yourself in the frame is another. Recent VUW Science and Society graduate Abby Hart wanted to explore the unsettling nature of genomics. As she explains, quote, my work is an edited photograph comprising 24 panels depicting fragments of my own personal data, my raw DNA data set which apparently comprise how I exist in the physical sense, but how I also exist in the form of data. Self-portrait is a meditation on multiple overlaying themes, how we exist in space as shadows of ourselves in the form of data, our participation in its commodification, privacy, and the truth value of data. She chose the medium of photography to express this because, similar to how data is believed by some to be pure and objective, in the, the photograph, these Cartesian and high-tech fantasies of transcending the body through pure thought or via free-floating internet subjectivities is cast as absurd. Photography and data create their own realities. Here, she says, I've combined the two systems to illustrate how we can only exist in data as fragments, narrowing in on certain layers of our being in an endless cycle of reflection and transmission that never presents a whole 
or entirely truthful picture. The same data set will tell a multitude of stories depending on the questions being asked of it and by whom. So the existential question of who am I is linked to location. Where am I? Geospatial representations are common in the data visualization lexicon, and there are many beautiful ones out there. New Zealand's own Chris McDowell and Tim Dene produced You Are Here, an award-winning collection of superb visualizations that decenter Western Cartesian cartographic assumptions. One of my favorites is the way in which Te Wai Punamu is portrayed anatomically as a living, breathing, circulatory, respiratory system. Freelance journalist and editor Betsy Mason talks about the innate attraction of maps and suggests our brains are especially built for maps to absorb visual stories. She says our brains relate to maps differently than to other data visualizations, and we more readily form emotional connections with maps. This is backed by both science and my experience, her experience, of seeing how others interpret them. Maps are this perfect combination of constraint and creativity. They're based on a very real framework defined by actual geography, but they leave just enough space for creativity and artistry that hits the right spot for human brains. A different cartographic spin is provided by Chicago-based web designer and Nicholas, Nicholas Rougeux, who harvested full text from public domain sites like Project Gutenberg and the Internet Archive, then used RegExer to filter the text, in the process, he redefined literature with his punctuation maps. Rishi explains, between the words, the name for the series, is an exploration of visual rhythm of punctuation in well-known literary works. All letters, numbers, spaces, and line breaks were removed from entire texts of classical stories like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Moby Dick, Pride and Prejudice, leaving only the punctuation in one continuous line of symbols in the order in which they appear. Outsourced as posters, reception reigned from the quirky how to enjoy great literature with all the pesky words, without all the pesky words, to admiration for translating the unseen uh, structure of literature into something that's not only graphically beautiful, but illuminating too. Punctuation tells us a lot about people. How many of you overuse the comma? Rely on dashes, neglect the semicolon, add exclamation marks after every sentence, um, display everything in full caps, we won't say who, um, deploy the interrobang. Writerly DNA resides in punctuation as much as in vocabulary and grammar. So that leads me to think, how do we relate in the digital environment to space, where scale, perspective, and relationality are negotiated positionalities, whether you're viewing a flat screen or a mediated, immersive AR, VR, or mixed reality experience. Now, scrolly telling alert. Scrolly telling is a form of interactive storytelling that unfolds as you scroll and includes elements that are activated or triggered by the scrolling. Once demonized as the scrolly telling scourge, along with full screen video backgrounds and parallax scrolling effects, this technique is actually widely adopted and accepted as a default navigation strategy. So here's Dylan Moriarty. He's telling the story of his hometown. He's telling a story in pictures, in movable text, with a rhythm that's control, controlled by the person doing the scrolling. He's claiming to us and saying to us that whatever the story is, it depends on where you are, how you relate, and what your emotional connection might be. Or perhaps a little more seriously, we have this story, the story of the cost of lighting. Now, how many of you would take lighting statistics and present it this way? Oh, it's dark in here, better turn the light on. That's better. Whew. And goes through a whole series of scenarios by which you have to work, albeit your index finger, through various scenarios that as we scroll will 
account for the amount of time it takes, whether you're in Babylon, whether you're in the Industrial Re Revolution. And interestingly enough, we have two seconds of labor noted and many seconds of scrolling not occurring. Next. Stories, you remember, not always have happy endings. A little closer to home, a cross-disciplinary team produced this. Thanks to Matt and my colleagues, we were given the challenge, Digital Humanities Project, what can you do? So what we enabled uh, through a mobile app was to bring to life the Wellington Waterfront Walk, where there is a series of poetry installations along the waterfront, uh, literally embedded into the landscape. Um, the smartphone app enables users to walk the locations through a combination of GPS, geolocation tracking, and AR uh, augmented reality. The digital collections in our library are fed into this particular web platform, and I'll leave the video to tell you one of the interactive features they were actually pretty pleased with. And in theory, oop, there we go, should work. Maybe? Down on the pulse. Thank you. There we go. Now, hope the volume. So the whole point of this was not only to interact with the local landscape, but actually insert yourself into the frame. So you were able to view the augmented reality experience, but, but you could drag and drop individual words in the poetic snippet and create your own poem. Be part of that writerly enterprise. And what that actually meant was that as readers, you're also, as interpreters, you're writers. You actually are creatives in your own right. So, let's move along. It was a day just like any other. Climate change has been jockeying with COVID for equal airtime. I'm sure you're all familiar with the range of graphs showing temperatures rising, although you may not have seen this version. As the Twitter post explained, a colleague of mine has been crocheting a blanket, a row a day, repeatable, the color of each row dependent on the temperature bracket for the day in Wellington, starting from the 1st of January, 2019. A story in its own right that goes from orange, yellow, light green, dark green, light blue, dark blue, warm to cold. How much more evocative might that be to some members of your public than a graph? Bit of a snoozer. This one, however, you can at least wrap around yourself and keep warm on those wonderful, rainy, cold Wellington days of which we never have any for our guests who are here today. Uh, here's another, but a surprisingly different approach. When faced with the challenge of sharing the latest climate change discoveries, we know scientists often rely on data graphics and technical illustrations, but Daniel Crawford at the University of Minnesota used his cello to communicate the latest climate science through music. Looks like we have to cue it up again. Whatever. Uh -huh. 
let's just move forward. Sobering. It was a dark and stormy night. You've probably seen enough COVID visualizations to last a lifetime, and I'll certainly leave that to the experts, Yup and Sean, for their keynote tomorrow. But what if you are visually challenged and cannot see the outpouring of COVID maps, graphs, and charts? Much more than acoustical backtrack, sound has been a critical medium for telling the pandemic story. Sonic Arts engineer Pedro Rabello at Queen's University in Belfast used World Health Organization situation reports to produce this soundscape, which reflects the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. A different version is from the Scottish Tech Army. Daily cases for Scotland, minimum value zero. Maximum value 3,200. From the 28th of February until the 8th of February, each tone represents one day.
If COVID data sonification addresses a very real issue, telling the story of vaccine nationalism offers a salutary reminder of the communicative power of visual representation. Should we use a map? Or a photograph? Can we create impact with this image or provoke a call to action with this one? I'll wrap up with a few takeaways. Even when you're swamped with data, lift your head out of the code and think about how to engage, explain, and enlighten your audience, whether they're your peers, your neighbors, or your family. What story do you want or need to tell? How do you find that sweet spot between data visuals and narrative? Draw your audience in. Connect with real people using what we call a narrative hook. Make it easy to navigate via thoughtful design, selecting the sensory channel best suited to your audience and your topic. Don't be afraid to experiment, to stretch, to think beyond words and visuals to other media, including sound, performance, immersive environments. Collaborate with fellow researchers, developers, designers. Story work thrives through co-design, co-development, co-testing with your communities. Critically, include a clear call to action. Finally, you might just take a leaf out of Jared Thorpe's next playbook, scheduled for release in May this year, entitled not Living with Data, but Living in Data. As the promo blurb notes, living in data keeps humanity front and center. Thorpe reminds us that the future of data is still wide open, that there are stories to be told about how data can be used and by whom. Living in data not only redefines what data is, but reimagines how it might be truly public. Who gets to speak its language and how, using its power, new institutions and spaces might be created to serve individuals and communities. Timely and inspiring, this book gives us a path forward, one where it's all up to all of us to imagine a more just and participatory data democracy. Thank you. Happy to take questions. And in fact, there is an incentive. They are called storytelling pencils. Included in them are the famous, it was a dark and story night. Uh, it was a day just like any other, once upon a time, etc. Best question or questions. Yes, welcome. Hi, I have a question about visual humanities. Go for it. I'm just wondering what can the research community do to improve the support of visual humanities in New Zealand and the creation of new stories? Um, and, and are there still major barriers for scholars and artists to interact with the New Zealand corpus of, of uh, text and images? Great question. I think he deserves a pencil. <laughs> um, Sometimes it feels like I'm living in two worlds. One is these great collaborative projects with amazing people from engineering and computer science. Um, and then me over here uh, talking to my historian colleagues and literary critics. And sometimes the worlds never seem to converge. And I think it's a behavioral thing. I think it's disciplinary specific. And the stylization of disciplines means that it's really difficult to break down those barriers. It's a lot to do with academic street cred. Um, if you're seen to be an interdisciplinary person, no one knows which box to pigeonhole you into. No one really understands where your academic output is going. And heaven forbid, if you're working with communities, that's another problematic that traditional academia can't really deal with. So I think the easiest thing is start a conversation. 
There is a new group, and Ingrid Mason will be talking about it uh, later in the program, um, called AI for LAM, Artificial Intelligence for Libraries, Archives, and Museums, because they're trying to address the question, at least in the Australasian context, that the digital humanists haven't been able to crack yet. And that's how to bring this detente between the disciplines together so we can tell new stories. There's an incredible number of digital assets out there, as you know, Brian, having generated many of them. But what do you do with them? I find in first and second year comp sci classes, students freak out when you give them text. They have no idea what to do with it. And yet, there's amazing things you can do with it. So part of it's training up us as academics and as teachers in the classroom to first year, if not before, get text in the classroom, get visuals in the classroom, start them thinking about the diversity of data that you can use, and to think about different ways of outputting that data and give them the freedom to be creative. There's nothing more empowering to students than enabling them to do that. So start the conversation, open the door. Usually I have to go knock on the doors. I'd love it for people to come and knock on mine. There has, um, but for the real, uh, more in the library sector, interestingly enough, than researchers on the ground. There is some uptake, yes, um, and Tim has led the way for many years. So it's there, but at the end of the day, you know, you can have all the, to the tech in your toolkit, but it's this kind of attitude, it's the behavior, it's how can I look at the the collaborations differently. Yeah. Thanks. Another pencil. Aha. Oh, sorry. I'm a... <laughs> Oop, a pen. You need a pencil. Um, so how do, how do you spark that creativity? I know you like, talk to each other, but like, the next pen spark makes it happen. Just take your data from one place to another. Well, think about your own research process. Um, what's that eureka moment? that you get when you're thinking about a uh, data corpus? You know, what kind of question are you asking? When you're sort of freewheeling, free thinking, doesn't have to be over a beer or a fine wine, you know, what are those challenges that you really, those questions you really want to ask? And if you've got a question you want to ask, then you figure out who am I going to ask it to and who do I go find to share the love? So part of that creativity is actually, can I frame up the question, the research problem, in a way that sounds inspiring? And most particularly, who am I going to do the research for? I mean, we don't do research as academics to produce journal articles, do we? A lot of the time, we do research on behalf of communities. We deal with real problems. We want to communicate those problems. So why not talk it up with people who aren't academics? Why not? I mean, some of the most satisfying moments are a mature student I had in one of my classes who said, for the first time, because I gave them the option to do a creative project, for the first time she could actually tell her family what she was doing at university. Because they had no idea. So part of it's just thinking about what inspires you, for whom, and how. There's no one formula for it. But if you have that energy, if you can light the flame, then people will come and warm themselves by your campfire, for sure. To mix metaphors. Hey. Oh, kia ora. Oh, yeah, I'll turn up my hearing aid. Well, I think you've answered your own question. You deserve a pencil anyway. <laughs> but I think 
let's add library carpentry into the equation. Let's uh, bring in some latent or nascent initiatives in Maori and Pacifica carpentry. I mean, at the end of the day, what is carpentry doing? Is it just training you up as technicians? Or is it putting that tech in a context? Because at the end of the day, you do have to tell somebody a story. And maybe part of it is, let's think of the tech in service of storytelling rather than just the tech. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for synergies. But there has to be a will. And uh, I'm available to run a software carpentry course on telling stories with data. Hint? Anyway, bring them on. Any other questions? Oh, Matt. Okay, so we need to repeat the questions. I'll ask a very brief question. Um, what does leveling up mean to you, Sydney? You've gone from being a reader in book history to doing major data projects with National Science Challenge funding. How do you? What is the skill that characterizes that trajectory for you? How have you got to where you are? So the question's all about what does leveling up mean to me? Um, being a, a person with many hats and having an interesting career trajectory, um, which didn't start with academia at all, but started with music, actually. Um, how do you reinvent yourself, I think? Um, when we think of leveling, I mean, it's a contradiction in terms, leveling up, right? I mean, it's supposed to be meant to be provocative. So when I think of leveling up, I immediately say, leveling? No. I don't want to be this guy on Kurt Vonnegut's graph. I want to be this one. Even if, for me, that's a mixed metaphor and just doesn't quite get it leveling up. Um, there's some key things. One is, is, I firmly believe I can never do it all myself. Um, and that you have to collaborate. You need to go get a great group of people around you and keep them, which is a challenge in the academic world. Um, you have to be able to... Uh, Show leadership, communicate, um, take risks. That's another key. So collaborative, take risks. Because if you don't take risks, you'll never leave your comfort zone. You'll never experiment. You'll never try anything different. And you, know, you might climb up the stairs to that Olympic diving board platform, but you're never going to jump off, are you? So taking risks. Um, listening. I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't have some amazing mentors and people that I respect can listen to and collaborate with. Um, so I guess that's sort of three hits. But still, leveling up for me suggests flatlining. Or it could be the steps. Maybe I'm Cinderella. But Glass shoes, I tell you, they are really uncomfortable. Have we got any questions coming from the virtual crowd? They don't want any pencils. I've been known to give out virtual chocolate fish. I've never tried virtual pencils. Anyway, if you do uh, want a pencil, first in, first serve, you have six choices. And I think we'll leave it at that, shall we? Thanks so much.